So welcome everyone to, um, today we're gonna to be talking about uh, remote viewing, right? Remote viewing, how it works, what it is, and a little bit about how to do it, right? Um, not sure if we'll do a demo, maybe we'll do a demo later, but it's like, what is remote viewing? How does it work? It's a, it's like a lot of things, especially those of us in the hypnosis and the NLP world, we know that what people think they know and what it seems to be are two different things. There's a lot of misinformation, um, you know, because a few years ago, 25 years ago, it was huge. And of course, you had all these interesting things going on about remote viewing and, you know, how secret it was and what the government did or didn't do, da, 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 da. And, you know, whether it was terminated, the remote viewing program or not, I mean, you get into all this cool stuff. But the coolest thing I ever saw, a little side, is there was a guy who was doing a remote viewing course and the government wanted it stopped. And so he had to walk in the room and he had these two big guys, you know, with the sunglasses and the earpiece in that were his bodyguards. And he said, ah, oh, these guys are here with me. You know, they're like X, whatever they were. They, I, whatever they were, spec ops, they always pick that term. And it's like, you know, because the government wants us to stop this. And uh, I saw a clip of it and he goes, what did I think of that? And I'm like, well, it's interesting because those guys are really spec ops. And they know the government wants you not to do this. The CIA, the DIA wants this stop. They would not take the contract to protect you. Right? I mean, that's my opinion. It's like, you know, whole airplanes can disappear. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah. So anyway, but it was a, I, I, I marveled at it from the marketing viewpoint, right? So it was great, but, you know, so let's start a little bit about it, about this wonderful stuff uh, called remote viewing. But first, we've got to give you a little bit of background, right? It all comes out of the Cold War, right? And everybody forgets how, especially people that don't remember it or weren't around when it was going on, it was really intense the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. You know, they were one up in each other. They did all kinds of weird stuff. You know, if the U.S. found out the Russians were doing something, we would go do it, vice versa. You know, uh, they say we only landed on the, Mar on the moon as quickly as we did because the Russians had the audacity to put a man in space before us, right? And the only reason they beat us getting the man in space is they didn't have the same issues about safety and protocol for the, for the, they just called them pilots at first. They didn't even have the word astronaut, right? So, because the first few things they sent up, the monkeys and the dogs, most of them came back dead. Um, so, but the Soviets put one up and suddenly we had to put one up and then Kennedy makes the speech, uh, which we could break down about future pacing, the future that we'll have a man on the moon by the end of the decade, da, 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 da. And I, if you remember that speech, I, I say we're going to do this not because it's easy, but because it's hard. It was a brilliant speech, right? But anyway, so the Soviets were doing stuff, and it got leaked out, or we found out they were, they were using psychics for different things in the military, right? Or in the military world, right? Whether it was mostly information gathering. So, of course, because they were doing it, we had to do it. Right. And it was very, it was very, it was very interesting. Right. And they had a couple of different programs that they started in the late seventies, early eighties. Right. Uh, we know it as the Stargate program. Stargate. Right. Yes. If you remember the TV show, it's kind of like that. Right. It was actually real Stargate program. And it was all about, you know, gathering information and making better warriors. That's what the whole thing was about, making a better warrior, which if you think about it, that's what the military wants to do, right? So it fell under the DIA, it's called the Defense Intelligence Agency. And Stargate was an offspin from a couple of other things, just to get factually correct. Uh, I think it was called Grill Flame. I don't know why, yeah, it's a typical military name you know, which was an offshoot of center lane. I don't know why they call it those things, but just so you, had, you could Google this, kind of cool. But it ended up doing the Stargate program, 
And then you had a couple of different things. You had remote viewing, right? Psychic development, which was part of that. And then um, the Jedi Project. Yes, they honestly named it the Jedi Project. And that was about making actual battlefield warriors, right? So it was kind of interesting, right? So this is where it comes from. Um, and what, what I like to look at it for, for the remote viewing is they actually had a systematic protocol, right? If you know anything about the military or any kind of real training, just because one person can do it, it's irrelevant if you can't figure out how they do it and duplicate it to more people, right? If you can have a, whatever it is, right? You're trying, they're trying to break it down so you can duplicate because that's what you have to do to get the military ready to do this, right? And they're pretty good at breaking stuff down and duplicating it, right? What is this? What's, what's driving this? You know, and a lot of this has to do with beliefs, right? How do you work with your beliefs, you know, and where that comes from? It's kind of, kind of cool. So how does that tie into this? Well, and how does that tie into what, what we know of as NLP? Well, let me tell you a quick story, <clears throat> and it's of... Um, one of the things that got NLP on the map was a, um, Tony Robbins used to talk about it. Of course, this was a long time ago. Um, long, long time ago. Early, 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 eight, about 80, 81. NLP was getting started. And one of NLP's claim to fame was, we can, if, if we know how you do something, going back to a training protocol, you know, Rich, uh, Richard Bandler and Grinder and those guys looked at Milton Erickson, who said, if, if we can break a, a, something down into small enough chunks and teach you those chunks, you should be able to replicate whatever it is we broke down to, to a standard, maybe not exactly the same, but you see this in, in, in things all the time. And we were just talking before we got started about artificial intelligence. Once a system gets started and you break it down into small enough chunks, right? then you can duplicate it and, it and you can absorb some of those things. So they wanted to test whether this stuff would really work, right? The military is always testing stuff. And so they, they decided to find a skill that most people aren't good at, but a few people are excellent at. And they've tried to teach this skill over and over again, hit or miss, right? And so the skill they decided to use was, uh, Pistol shooting, right? It's an interesting skill. Some people are great at it. Other people can't literally hit the broadside of a barn, right? And if you think this is the military, those kind of skills are very important, right? And so when they went to study it, of course, the military said, well, here, let us show you our protocol of how we train people if they got to get qualified in a sidearm, right? in, a, in, a, in a hand weapon, as it's called. And you know, the guys running the thing, Bamber, Grinder, guy named Wyatt Woodsmall. From what I understand, Tony Robbins was on the team. He was not the lead guy at the time. He was just, he was helping, from what I understand. I don't know if that's true or not. Of course, these things get convoluted after 40 years. But they were, first thing they said is, we don't want to know what you're doing because it's a horrible, but what your results are aren't that good, you know. Over half the people didn't qualify with the handgun, with the hand weapon, right? At least on first round. It took them several rounds. It was a five-day training. I still remember that. And this is in a book. You can Google it. And it's also in a book. Um, Warrior's Edge, Strategies for the Corporate Battlefield by Colonel John Alexander, who was part of the Stargate program. And this pistol shooting was a five-day training, right? And they shot about 750 plus rounds of ammunition. And again, this is the military. They're looking at it from a training viewpoint. Put on your business hat. Five days. That means you're paying all these soldiers, sailors, air, whoever was being trained. They're getting paid. You had the trainers getting paid. You had to put them up. You had to have facilities. This is cost. And shoot 750 rounds of ammunition. This is expensive. So the, they said, well, this is the it's five-day training. This is what we do. Less than 50, if I remember right, 
less than 50% uh, qualify. So they said, well, if we do this um, and we figure it out, we should be able to do it in, in a less than half the time, less than half the ammunition, and it should work. So they, they said, okay, let's, let's test it. What was interesting, rather than go back and look at the protocol the Army had, uh, they decided to um, model, it was the term that was taking off at the time, the, the three top shooters that they could find in the Army, a colonel and two sergeants. Their whole job was, was pistol shooting in, in events in America, all over the world. They were, went to the Olympics. I mean, it's just like, you know, military does that, right? So that, that was their whole job, was shooting in events. And they were great. They were some of the world's best. So the first thing they did was look at what they were doing. How do they handle the weapon? How do they do this? How do they do that? There were some similarities, but not, you know, every person had a little bit of an idiosyncrasy, if you will. Maybe, they, you know, their pre-ritual. You know, one person, I remember they said, you know, once he started and he did this, if he got interrupted in the process, he had to sit down and start from scratch, kind of like if you're a sports fan, you see baseball players, if they have a ritual, you can't interrupt it. But other people, it was fine. They just pick up the weapon, do what they do. Other than the fact, they were all able to control their breathing. They were able to slow their breathing down at will. So they went, this is something we can learn. This is something we can duplicate. Because right? again, if your breathing speed speeds up, and you start getting nervous, it, it affects your hands. When you're trying to shoot a weapon, that's not good, right? And so that was something that they could do. They go, we could, we could, we could teach that. The other thing that they decided to do was look at what are the beliefs of these pistol shooters, right? Well, they all believed that shooting was easy. It was natural, right? Anyone should be able to do it. Uh, it was also a skill. Once you learn it, you could you could just do it. It wasn't that hard, right? Now, that's not normal for a lot of people, especially in a military environment, right? And so then, so they first thing they did is figure out what we're going to do is teach people the belief sets, how to control their breathing, and then we'll go jump right into shooting. Okay. And so they brought in some people to test, people that didn't have any preconceived notions about shooting the handgun, whether it was positive, negative, they were kind of just neutral. They were, okay, you know, it's another skill we got to learn. Military makes us learn a lot of skills. Okay, so they were neutral. And they kept installing this idea that it's easy, it's natural, anyone can do it. It's, it's a skill, once you learn it, it'll stay with you forever, you know? almost to the point, it'll be fun. So they brought in the people, had them sit there, I think it was 12 or 15, and said, okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna have, you know, the next couple of days, we're doing this skill set about shooting a pistol. Now, contrary to what you may or may not have heard, it's an easy skill to learn, it's natural. In fact, we don't understand why more, more people aren't good at this. You know, anyone can do it. Once you learn it, it'll be a skill that'll stay with you forever. Again, they're blank slates. They're sitting there and these people with authority are saying, do it this way, this way, this way, right? Okay. Now, first of all, the NCOs were losing their minds in the back of the room. That's not how military training usually starts, right? Especially this would have been in like late 70s, early 80s. If you ever been around, it's, if you ever seen military movies, if you haven't been in the military, it's true. When you're first starting a training, it usually doesn't start with, hey, how's everybody doing? It's going to be easy. It's going to be fun. You know, it starts with that. You're a maggot. You're not worth the ground you're walking on. You're not even, a, you shouldn't be allowed to breathe the air I'm breathing. You know, most of you are going to fail at this course. That's what they tell you, you know, like boot camp. You know, look around. At least, at least what I went through. Look around. 25% of you will not be here. Some of you are going to have to repeat this course. You know, it, it was like, Okay, everybody's sitting there, right? But these guys are saying it's easy, it's natural, it's fun, you're gonna, it's easy to do, da 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 da. Not normal for the military. Then they taught them the breathing technique, you know, 
how to control their breath, which by the way, they, the military didn't really do. They just say, slow your breathing down. They wouldn't bother to teach you how, right? The other thing, the belief that was so important that these people had is that the bullet wants to hit the target. The bullet in the gun wants to hit the target. That's the bullet's job. It was created to hit that target. And if I don't fuck it up, the, excuse my language, the bullet will hit the target. And they didn't shoot the weapon. Ladies and gentlemen, you are not going to shoot this weapon. You're going to allow the, rain, the, uh, the, 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 the round to go down range. You're going to allow the, rain, book, the, the round to go down range. You're going to release it to do what it was intended to do. All right, fine. Right. Different skill set. So these guys had that. So anyway, if I remember right, after a day and a half, shooting less than, I think it was 250 rounds, everybody qualified. Over 50% shot expert. If you ever shot a handgun, especially they were using 45, so it's just not an easy, easy handgun to shoot. They were doing great. Right? And on a follow-up, they, they maintained that skill through time, right? Even if they didn't shoot a lot. It was like, as they, as they would say up here, it's like, it's like riding a bike. Once you learn it, you know, you might get a little shaky on the bike when you first get on it, unless you're like, you know, Diamond Diller there and you ride a lot, you know, you might shake a little bit. So these people kept it. So that was what they learned. And again, great results. Did the military use this information? Ladies and gentlemen, do you think the military used this information? No. Right? First of all, they said it would be too hard to retrain the NCOs to think that way, teach it in a different way. Right? And there's a couple of logistical things, right? But the group that liked this thinking was the special operations community. You know, it's like the mindset. How do you do this? How do you do that? So anyway, that's a little bit of a background. So, so they, how does that tie into what we're doing? Well, it's going to be kind of interesting, right? So if, you know, so now we get into remote viewing, right? Right, the Stargate program, right? And I'm going to tie it into using the NLP and how to duplicate it as we go along. But so the first thing they did is they decided to find some people that were naturally good at intuitive behavior, skill sets like that, right? Uh, if you want to call it psychic stuff, people that were good at it, right? And, and again, they were looking at what are your beliefs about it? You know, if you were psychic, they were, if they'd be interviewing you for this. So you're, 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 Pre, you have precognition, you seem to know things, that, whatever it is your, your shtick was, right? They interviewed a whole bunch of different psychic. What are your beliefs? And it was kind of the same thing. It's a natural skill. Everybody has it. Just kind of have to train it. And once you train it, it'll stay with you through time. Right? And it's easy. Right? And they all kind of had the same thing of, you know, it wasn't 100% accurate. And that's okay, right? It was just information and we're gonna use it. So they said, so when they went to like, start lurk, looking at remote viewing and they found the people that seemed to have some of this skill, it was not about, right? The reason they call it remote viewing, came the buzzword for it. It was not about an out-of-body experience of you going into some kind of trance state, leaving your body, going wherever it is you're going to go and visit the target, whether it's a ship or an airfield. This is military. So they're looking for stuff like that, right? No, it was the people that were good at it, with this remote viewing, they, they kind of just downloaded or knew where the target was, right? And that they were getting the information from whether they wanted to call it God, the universe, the collective consciousness, whatever it happens to be. They were just downloading the information. And then they could translate the download that they got. It was like the great analogy we have now that they didn't have when we were doing when they were doing it was the internet. 
they would have to tap in to the right information that would be instantly downloaded to your computer, which was their brain, right? Which makes sense. Okay, it's downloaded. But when it's first downloaded, can you read it? Right? When all that raw data comes in, it's ones and zeros. We're watching the video. You're seeing me move around and do my do this, right? If you just saw the data, you you couldn't, it's data, it's just raw data, right? So anyway, so they they decided they were gonna try to train people in this. So they figured out again, same thing. What are the thoughts? It's natural, it's normal, it's a skill you can learn. Um, you're just gonna have to train yourself to tap into this, they use the term collective consciousness. Now we would say the matrix, if you will. Just tap into it, right? And you're gonna download this information. And so it's kind of cool, right? That they're going to get, you're going to do this. But what happens because the information's downloaded and it's not in words, there's no word. This part of the information coming from this is just raw data. It's going to come across as feelings, right? Maybe images, you know, feelings, images, you know. It's not things you can put to words very easily. That's the problem that people run into, right? So then they decided, okay, now we're gonna, we got this stuff, we're gonna teach people how to do it, go into a relaxed state. And now they took a little bit from um, the Silva method, go into an alpha state and then just get this information, right? And it's gonna come into you as a feeling, as an image, as just something in your nervous system that you can't explain, then you have to decode it. Kind of like your computer has to take the ones and the zeros and go through whatever it does to make us read the text or do whatever it is, right? Um, so when they went to interview people, they had to find people that were open to learn. So who's good at this? They found and they started to do it. Were people that really had no judgment about psychic abilities one way or the other. The thing they did find is the people that thought they were psychic were horrible at learning the skill. Not, it was a little counterintuitive, right? Not really, if you look at the military, the people that go in the military thinking they're gonna be these great warriors are usually the ones that wash out in boot camp. You know? People think, I'm going in the military, I'm going to be a general. Guess what? You got to start here, you got to go here, you got to go here, you got to go here. You don't, you know, you don't do that, right? So they had to be, you know, open to learning. No judgment one way or the other, right? The other thing they found that the people that were best at it were mission focused, right? We just want to get this done, right? You know? And they were all open to the idea of a collective consciousness that you could tap into. So whatever information you want to find is in the collective unconscious. And your job is to download. Now, we've all heard that kind of stuff, but most people don't have a protocol to do it. And what remote viewing does is start giving you that, that, that protocol, right? To get that digital download and turn it into things you can use. And so most of their training wasn't, was this part was pretty easy. Okay, if you're open to learn, we're going to teach you how to do this, control your breathing, relax, tap into the collective unconsciousness. You're going to get a download of information that will just like feel like a shock, right? And then your whole job is to decode that information, right? And the last thing with it is no... Free imagination about what you're looking for. Right? What I mean by that is if you're trying to decode whatever this information is you get, and it's like, oh, I, I, it feels cold, it feels dark, it feels hard. It usually comes in feelings and images, right? And so if you use your imagination, oh, then it must be like a ship, if you come from the Navy, a ship, you know, or a cave, could be anything, right? 
So the hard part was not to get people to use their imagination. The moment your imagination gets involved, you know, it was like your imagination get involved, it usually messed up the mission, right? And so the way they started to train people was with the breathing to relax, to tap into the collective consciousness. They would get a data point they were looking at. And the best way to do it is not like go find, you know, go find where the terrorist is hiding, right? Then again, if you got that kind of command, your imagination will kick in, you know? Oh, he's hiding in a cave in these mountains. Like that's your imagination. Only took us 20 years to find out, no, he's living in a nice place in, uh, in a city. You know, it's like interesting, right? Um, the other thing they found, just as an aside, is it was always hard to find a person because people constantly move. It was easier to find a hard target, right? But so it was, you know, decoding the information. So they taught the people a quick protocol of relax, tap into the collective unconsciousness, and then they would get a code of what they were looking for. And the way the code worked is the way they did it was like just four numbers, right? Four num random numbers, let's say like two, seven, eight, four. Now, if I was your handler, and these people had handlers, I know what 2784 is. So if you were my group, right? Ladies and gentlemen, relax, do this, take a deep breath. They would do the protocols, just get a little relaxed, tap into the collective unconscious. You're gonna get this information and your target is 2784. I repeat, 2784. And then they, you would be trained when I took the training, right? That the minute you hear that and you're tapped in, your hand would make some kind of motion on the paper. Might be, a, might be a squiggly line, it could be a circle, whatever it was. That is where the information is. It'd be like you opening up the, the, the program running, whatever it is on your computer, it's gonna be all the ones and zip, however code looks, right? I can ask my wife, right? It makes no goddamn sense unless you know, even if you're looking at it, it your brain can't comprehend it, right? It's this. So then what you have to do is go through and decode what this means. And the way you decode it, they develop the system, right? Is you start with sensory-based info. Sensory. Is it, you know, to use our sensory-based info, is it hot or cold? Is it, you know, is it moving or still? Is there pressure or no pressure? And you would go through, you go through each one, like all the kinesthetics. You go through, is it light or dark? Or is it close or far away? What sounds are you hearing? So you decode the information. So if you had a team, if we we're gonna do this, if you had a team and you decode the information, let's say there's four people on a team, and you, you give the guy, okay, here's what I think it is, and whatever it is, you know. And I would collect the data, say, thank you. And they'd leave and come back in after a while and say, we got the target. We found the target. Okay. Or we didn't find the target. Either way, but usually it's like we found the target. And one of their tests was, this one I like, was if one of, let's say you had a team of four, if one of the four said, great, which one of us got it? They were kicked out of the program, right? Because then you were not mission. It's not you doing it. The team got it, right? The biggest, you know, literary uh, uh, thing that they do with the military, especially with spec op warriors, is like these guys are like Rambo. You ever been in that world? No, you're always a team guy. You know, Bruce is the. Bruce is the weapons guy. Carolyn is the explosive expert. Danea is the communication person. I mean, we all cross train, but we just, we do the mission together or we don't, right? So that was kind of cool that if you, if you had to know who it was, you were kicked out of the program, right? And so, you know, the whole training became, most of it, you know, they could teach you this part, 
pretty quick. And then practicing decoding is what takes a while, right? Does this make sense to everybody, right? And this is just how, you know, and it's like, now the side effect of this core or this thing, and they supposedly, de they then the DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency, turned it over to the CIA in the early 90s. And then they did some, whatever, they brought in people that did a, feasibility study, whether the stuff really worked, they decided it didn't. Um, so they got rid of the remote viewing protocol, right? The remote viewing thing. Or they said they did, right? Because the best way to uh, hide something is to just say it's not there, you know? They're still doing it. Yeah, I didn't say that. You want to see the video? No, that, that I didn't say that. But whatever. It is. But it's like there's that. Also, with this, especially for remote viewing, it was the advent of the satellites that are so detailed they could pack back then, and now it's even better. But now they could they could literally take a picture of a pack of cigarettes from 400 miles in space. Right? It's easier to just okay. We're looking for this. Put the satellites over wherever, Afghanistan, Iraq, and it, they could just take all these pictures. You don't have to, you know, you know, and then it, and the technology was growing so fast, even like looking for submarines, which is one of the things they were doing. Um, again, from a satellite, now we can not just take a picture of the ocean. We have the thermal stuff, da, 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 da. They could see down through several hundred feet of the ocean, right? Which was easier to do. And they said they got rid of it. I don't know if they did or not. But, you know, um, well, one of the side effects from interviewing the people afterwards, the, the people that were in the first round, is they all said the same thing, which was once you learn this skill, you can't turn it off. It's there. You just start knowing shit, as one lady said. It's just like you just know stuff, right? And it... A couple of them said it was kind of like you just remove the, the societal pressures for that intuitive natural state that like a shaman might have or a, a person um, might know. And it's just the info, you just know, right? And sometimes you can't say why you know or how you know. Right? And then they would talk about, then they, they could go and like decode it, like what are what's going on here, right? Uh, so that is a little bit about remote viewing, you know, and it's a fascinating subject. And there's courses, there's, you want to get it more detailed in it, right? It's about opening up that connection to the collective consciousness, whether it's a beam of light, thing of energy, right? You're like the computer terminal that's getting the information, right? And you just have to go in and reset the parameters of your system so you can understand the data that's being downloaded, right? Fascinating stuff, I love it. But it does seem when you turn it on, it's hard to turn it off, right? And I'll tell you the truth, because God is my witness, what I lie, right? Uh, yeah, probably, but this one, it's like, it's one of those things, once you turn it on, now that I'm teaching again, it starts to reactivate it, right? It's kind of a pain in the ass. And what I mean by that, I'll be at a conference, I'll be going, that person is just totally full of shit, right? Well, everybody else likes him. I don't know. I just, I just, that person just pulling shit. What makes you think that? Because suddenly I got to take a dump and I'm just standing here and I know this, or this girl is just, you know. And then if I take a few moments when I'm into it, it's like, okay, then I'll process through. Okay, what they're doing, this happens a lot in our field. It's like, eh, they kind of know it's bullshit, but it's a way to make money. 
you know? And if you honestly believe it for whatever reason they believe it, that's okay. But it's like, once you turn this on, you know, do you want to turn this on? Everybody says they do, but do you want to, right? And the way you do that is you just keep practicing it, like, you know, connecting, and then listening to the info you get. I was first learning this, right? And I lived in uh, just outside Chicago. And I had to go to Chicago for something, right? And I remember I'm driving and I look at my watch because I'm an intelligent, articulate guy and I kind of know things, right? And I got to get to Chicago. And it was like 1230 in the afternoon, one o'clock. So I should be able to get on this one highway and get up to where I needed to go. It was before rush hour. And so I'm driving there to get on the highway. And it's just like, I got that. Don't do this. Take this other way. Get on the Skyway, right? Which was a toll road, which cost a couple bucks. Right, but they both get you to the same place about the same time if there's no traffic. But I'm like, yeah, it's one, it's it's one in the afternoon. It's not rush hour yet, and I'm going to get up there, do what I need to do, and then come back after rush. Hour. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. But my gut, and the closer I got to the on ramp, it's like, uh, I'm like, yeah, I got this. And I get on the highway. About a mile down the road, traffic stops. Right, a, a tanker truck had overturned. I was stuck on the highway for the next six hours, right? Because you couldn't turn around, you're on, this, you're on an expressway, right? And then everything's backed up and you were just, you know, everybody's getting out of their car, running into the side of the road to take a leak. And you were like, you were about a mile from one, from getting on the exit, you know, getting on. And it was about another mile before the next, it was a perfect storm to have a truck a tanker truck overturned with hazardous chemicals. It was in the Chicagoland area where there's all these steel mills and hazardous chemicals, so everything shut down. It's like, ah, you know? So that was a my gut telling me that what I should do. So afterwards, the first thing I had to do was thank it for the info and apologize to whatever it was that I didn't listen, right? I know one person that took this info and they taught it to, to people that had a tendency to always pick the wrong romantic partner. Put it nicely, right? Walk in a room, there's a hunt, let's use women, I'll make fun of women. You know, she's looking for a for a for a partner. Walk in a room, there's a hundred guys, 90. Five of them are great guys that just want a good relationship, open, caring, yada, yada, yada. A few are kind of sketchy, and one's a complete batshit, narcissistic maniac. Those are the only people she wants to talk to. Right? She's misreading, maybe, you know, confusing the danger with excitement. I forgot what this lady, how she would talk to people about this, because people that have this tendency to get into serial bad relationships. Their friends would say, you're always dating the same person. The face changes a little bit, but the, you know, the alcoholism, the drug addiction, the violence, all, that remains the same, right? So you had to retrain what you were looking for. And she would teach these people, mostly women, that like, well, what you're doing is putting out to the universe is bring me excitement. You know, an ex-con drug addict dealing drugs could be an exciting relationship, right? It won't get you what you really want, but it, you know, the, the universe is giving you what you want, right? You need to change your target that you're looking for. Right? So that was the person that took this information and ran with it. And does that make sense to everybody, right? And so again, it's this and that, right? What's your gut say, right? And can you decode this information? So I find this stuff fascinating. You know, maybe one of these days we'll do a practical session on NLP or NLP for um, the remote viewing and actually do a target package, right? a couple of target packages, right? But 
again, when I looked at this, because I come from this world of NLP, and I remember the, um, the shooting thing and, and chunking, what we would call, it's like, okay, this is what they're teaching, right? And it's systematic and it's structured, how they break it down. And you, you know, almost any skill you can learn how to do if you understand the steps to learn that skill, right? Whatever the skill is you want to learn. So, let me turn this off. Hey. Does that make sense to everybody? Right? And so it's to tap in to get that feeling and then decode that feeling. And in the remote viewing world, it was usually a, a, an autonomic, autonomic response, those of us in the auto like boom, and then you decode what it, what's, what's in that scribbly line or that, however it comes to you with no judgment, like, okay, and it would start with the very, going back to our NLP, is it hot or cold, moving or still, big or small, da, 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 all the sensory-based kinesthetic language. And then is it light or dark? If so, what color? Da, da, is it panoramic or narrow? Is it this? Is it that? So you go through all that and you're just writing all this information down that doesn't, and keep your imagination out of it is the hard part, right? And then all of a sudden it just kind of begins to coalesce around whatever the whatever it is. All right, stop.